From Plassey to Partition Chapter 4 Emergence of Indian Nationalism Part 3 The New Middle Class and the Emergence of Nationalism Nationalism at an organized level at the top, as against peasant anti-colonial resistance described above, emerged in India in the late 19th century. The rise of nationalism, it is often argued, was favored by industrialization, urbanization and print capitalism. And nationalism in the developing world of Asia and Africa, as Benedict Anderson, 1983, tells us, is supposed to have followed one or the other model developed in the West. This theory, which denies intellectual agency to the people of Asia in shaping their own history, has recently come under criticism from a wide variety of ideological positions. Paul Chatterjee, for example, has argued that if the West defined subjectivity and prescribed our predicament, and also imagined for us the forms of our resistance to colonial regimes, then what was really left for us to imagine? He argues therefore that long before the political struggle for power began, the Indian society was imagining its nation in a private cultural sphere, even though the state was in the hands of the colonizers. It was here that they imagined their own domain of sovereignty and constructed an Indian modernity that was modern but not Western. It was from here, i.e., from this cultural construction of a space for autonomy in the early 19th century, that Indian nationalism started its career. C. A. Bailey, on the other hand, has traced the roots of Indian nationalism to its pre colonial days, it emanated from what he describes as traditional patriotism which was a socially active sentiment of attachment to land, language and cult that developed in the subcontinent long before the process of westernization, red modernization, had begun. In India of the 18th and early 19th centuries, such sentiments were emerging on a regional basis as homeland was being defined by various terms like Desh, Vatan or Nadu, where identities were gradually taking shape with the development of regional languages and religious affiliations. But although regionally centered at Bengal, Maharashtra, Avad or Mysore, their isolation broke down through various means of communication. The political legitimacy of the Mughal Empire was recognized throughout Hindustan, which was thought to be the abode of both Hindus and Muslims, and cultural barriers melted down through commercialization and regular pilgrimages. As the East India Company established its hegemony, Bailey argues, this traditional patriotism manifested itself through various indigenous critiques of foreign rule deviating from the established ethical traditions of good government and through irate reactions to Christian missionary propaganda. Finally, it burst forth through numerous acts of resistance, participated by both the princes and the commoners, culminating in the revolt of 1857. After the revolt, a modern sector of politics gradually evolved in India, through rapid spread of education, development of communication systems, such as the railways and telegraph, and the emergence of a new public space created by the colonial institutions. Although old patriotism did not completely die out during this period, it was significantly reworked and reshaped, if at this point we may go back to Chatterjee to create a new colonial modernity that was different from that of the West. We may trace here very briefly the initial phase of that complex and ongoing transformatory process that tried to fuse together, not always seamlessly though, all those regional, local and fragmentary identities into a modern nation. The political history of India in the post-1857 period when the political contest with the colonial regime began at a more modern institutionalized public space is multifaceted. First of all, in colonial policies, a conservative reaction set in after the revolt of 1857. Attempts were made to rehabilitate and strengthen the landed aristocracy, deemed to be the natural leaders of the people. They could alone command the allegiance of the masses and could therefore be the reliable allies of a vulnerable colonial state. The Imperial Darbar of 1877, where Queen Victoria assumed the title of the Empress of India, and which Lord Lytton, the then Viceroy, organized in great splendor and pomp, despite famine conditions occurring in some parts of the country, 
gave the place of precedence to the native princes in the new imperial social order. Apart from them, big zamindars from now on began to play a prominent role within the colonial administrative setup. The British Indian Association was the first major voluntary organization in India founded in 1851 in Calcutta, representing primarily the local landlord interests. It began to play a prominent role after the Indian Council's Act of 1861, which provided for limited Indian representation in the legislative councils. Members of this association were usually nominated to the legislative councils and their dominance continued until the Act of 1892 introduced limited electoral system. But although old elements continued to dominate this organization, it was also new in many respects and performed some very new roles. For example, unlike its predecessor the Landholders Society that had many non-official Anglo-Indians among its members, the British Indian Association was exclusively Indian in its membership. And it was created on the eve of the renewal of the Charter of the East India Company to send petitions to the British Parliament to express the legitimate demands of the Indian subjects. It initially tried to coordinate the efforts of the three presidencies in this regard by opening up branches in Bombay and Madras. But regional barriers ultimately stood in the way, as to other similar associations, the Madras Native Association and the Bombay Association came into existence in 1852 for the same purpose. The three presidency associations sent three separate petitions to London, but, interestingly, all of them made almost identical demands. What they wanted was a greater participation in the administration of their own country and what they complained against were the perplexing dual system of government, expensive and incompetent administration, legislations unresponsive to the feelings of the people, high taxation, salt and opium monopolies and the neglect of education and public works. They were not against British rule as such, but felt, as the Calcutta petition made it clear, that they had not profited by their connection with Great Britain, to the extent which they had a right to look for. Thus, the educated members of the landed gentry who headed these associations were contributing to the evolution of a modern sector in Indian politics. But their agitation over charter was treated with almost contemptuous indifference by the authorities in London, as Mehrotra tells us, the new Government of India Act of 1853 incorporated none of their demands. For, ironically, it was not the educated Indians, but the uneducated and uninformed that the Raj was expecting its gravest danger from. This official assumption of an unquestionable loyalty of the landlords and educated Indians was premised on the latter's self-professed faith in the providential nature of British rule and their scornful attitude towards the peasant rebellions of the first half of the 19th century and later disapproval of the revolt of 1857. But this was a misconception, to say the least. For behind this loyalism there was also a growing awareness of the ignominy involved in their state of subordination. The unabashed show of loyalty by the Calcutta literati during the revolt of 1857 also came with a sense of dilemma. As the Hindu patriot wrote in an introspective editorial, this loyalty springs nearer from the head than from the heart. It was from the early 19th century that the Calcutta intellectuals had begun to criticize what they considered to be certain undesirable aspects of colonial rule. Ram Mohan Roy started a modest constitutional agitation on such demands as the separation of powers, freedom of the press, trial by jury, and the Indianization of the services, many of these issues being later taken over by the members of the Young Bengal. In 1841, at a meeting of the short-lived Deshahitashini Sabha, Society for the Amelioration of the Country, a young Derosian, Sardaprasad Ghosh noted with angst that our deprivation of the enjoyment of political liberty is a cause of our misery and degradation. The precocious image of an empire based on interracial partnership nurtured by an earlier generation of Dwarkanath Tagore was ruthlessly shattered by the controversy over the so-called Black Acts, which proposed to place the British-born subjects under the criminal jurisdiction of ordinary courts from which they were previously exempt. The Act was passed in 1850, but was put on hold for fear of a white rebellion. 
The controversy around it, however, drove a wedge between the two racial elements in colonial society. The same year, despite united protests from the Hindus of Madras, Nagpur and Calcutta, the government went ahead with the LEX Loci Act, which gave the Christian converts the right to inherit their ancestral properties. The act, the Hindus widely believed, would open floodgates to Christian conversion. The growing racial tension, threat of conversion, and the reforming zeal of the Benthamite administrators made the educated Indians stand back and have a hard look at their own culture. This resulted in a process which Bernard Cohn, 1987, has described as the objectification of culture, with the educated Indians defining their culture as a concrete entity that could easily be cited, compared, referred to and used for specific purposes. This new cultural project, which partly manifested itself through the social and religious reforms of the 19th century, was encoded in the word Renaissance. Its purpose was to purify and rediscover an Indian civilization that would be conformant with the European ideals of rationalism, empiricism, monotheism, and individualism. It was meant to show that Indian civilization was by no means inferior to that of the West, but in one sense, in its spiritual accomplishments, was even superior to it. Evidence of this search for a superior national culture could be found in the development of a patriotic regional literature in Bangla. Marathi, Tamil, Telugu and Hindi, in the evolution of new art forms, in the search for purer forms of classical music and in the construction of new ideals of womanhood. All of these were projected as modern, but were predicated upon the spiritual superiority of the Indian past. In other words, as already mentioned, this movement was meant to fashion a modern national culture that is nevertheless not Western. This sense of pride in the spiritual essence of Indian civilization, as opposed to the material culture of the West, not just helped Indians reorganize and sanctify their private spheres of life, its ideological inspiration also motivated them to confront the colonial state in a newly emerging public space. This, in other words, provided the ideological foundation of modern Indian nationalism that developed in the late 19th century. This ideology was, of course, not without contradictions, as the sense of pride in the spiritual heritage was often reduced to an uncritical and obscurantist defense of all customs and practices of the past. And what was more important, this 19th century invention of the Indian tradition, as Vasudha Dalmia argues, conveniently bypassed, ed, the long stretch of Muslim rule to present an idealized form of Indian Hindu tradition rooted in classical Sanskrit texts that were now put to modern usage. This created an identity that was inclusive and exclusive at the same time, it united the Hindus in opposition to an alien rule, but alienated the Muslims, non-Brahmins, and the untouchables. This problematic of Indian nationalism, which is referred to as Hindu revivalism, often thought to be the genesis of communalism. The evolution of Indian nationalism might not have been the result of Western modular influences in the same way as Benedict Anderson had thought, but the role of Western education was important nevertheless, as it produced a critical public discourse conducive to its growth. If this education was designed to colonize the mind of the Indian intelligentsia, and breed in them a sense of loyalty, the latter also selectively appropriated and manipulated that knowledge of domination to craft their own critique of colonialism. But this critical consciousness was unevenly shared by groups of Indians, as education itself had an extremely uneven growth. Higher education began to grow rapidly in India after universities were established in the three presidencies in 1857 and education became a free enterprise in 1882. The number of students in arts and professional colleges grew fourfold, from 4,499 in 1874 to 18,571 in 1894. The total number of students under instruction was a little over 4 million in 1896 to 1897, the number more than doubled by 1920. But this growth was highly uneven, and obviously it had a bearing on the uneven development of political consciousness in the various regions of India. The three coastal presidencies of Bengal, Bombay and Madras, 
as the available statistics suggest, witnessed wider expansion of education than the heart of North India then constituted into three provinces, i.e. the Northwestern Provinces and Avad, Punjab and the Central Provinces. Within the presidencies again, certain communities were more advanced than the others were. In Bengal, Higher education was monopolized by the Bhadralok belonging mainly to the three higher castes of Brahman, Kayastha and Baidya. In Bombay it remained mostly confined to Chitpavan Brahmins and the Parsis, in Madras, among the Tamil Brahmins and the Ayangas. Again in Bengal, the Bengalis were far ahead of the Odias, Biharis and Assamese. In Bombay, the Marathi-speaking regions were ahead of the Gujarati-speaking areas and in Madras, the Tamil-speaking area surged ahead of the Telugu and Malayalam-speaking regions. And in general, the Hindus were far ahead of the Muslims, and among the Hindus, a significant proportion of the lower castes and untouchables remained excluded from education. Those who went for higher education were coming from the middle or declining gentry whose income from land was dwindling, forcing them to look for subsidiary sources of income. For them government employment was the obvious choice, but in this sector, where the domination of the Europeans and Eurasians was quite palpable, Indians were confined only to subordinate positions and were poorly paid. Independent professions, like teaching, engineering, medicine and above all the legal profession became their next desirable option, but here too supply soon outstripped demand. The situation described above undoubtedly created frustration and as Anil Seel argued, engendered a spirit of increasing competitiveness between various groups and regions. But nationalism did not grow out of material frustration alone, and to say that competition forestalled unity is to simplify a much more complex scenario. Obviously, the differential growth of education impacted on the level of political activities in different regions i.e. the presidencies with higher level of education were politically more articulate than the provinces. But this happened because Western education here exposed many more students to a variety of ideological influences that helped create a critical discourse that held the colonial state under stringent scrutiny. If English education was introduced initially to inculcate a spirit of loyalty it also exposed Indians to quote Air Desai, to the rationalist and democratic thoughts of the modern West. These ideas came to constitute an ideological package, which Deepesh Chakrabarti has called political modernity, consisting of such concepts as citizenship, the state, civil society, public sphere, human rights, equality before the law, the individual, distinctions between public and private, the idea of the subject, democracy, popular sovereignty, social justice, scientific rationality, and so on. Not that the colonial regime offered all these to its subjects, but they were projected as ideal milestones on the road towards progress. The educated Indians now deployed these same ideas to construct their own critique of an autocratic and arrogant colonial state, and mixed with an emotional patriotic belief in the superiority of Indian culture and civilization, this helped them to formulate conscious theories of nationalism. The Hindu patriot in June 1857 described the Indian as strong enough, in mind and knowledge to assert his right of citizenship. In July 1878 the Indian mirror averred more firmly that we fight for our rights in India. In September that year a public meeting in Calcutta was even more explicit. Its resolution put forth in no uncertain words the claims of the people of this country to the rights of British citizenship. The Indian patriots of the late 19th century were not questioning the imperial connection. But Her Majesty's loyal subjects were also gradually turning into conscious citizens, demanding their rights from an authoritarian colonial state. A rapidly growing print culture circulated such ideas across the subcontinent, by 1875 there were about 400 Indian-owned newspapers published in both English and the regional languages with an estimated readership of 150,000. These newspapers, as S. R. Mehrotra writes, broke down internal barriers and encouraged interregional solidarity. In the second half of the 19th century, 
The educated Indians had many reasons to be concerned about their rights being trampled by the colonial state. It started with the continuing threats of Christian conversion, encouraged by the passage of the Elix Loci Act in 1850, protecting the right of a convert to inherit ancestral property. But more importantly, when in the 1860s and 1870 various parts of India were experiencing a series of natural calamities and outbreak of famines, the government imposed an income tax in 1860, without giving Indians any control over the expenditure of this revenue income. The Indian Councils Act of 1861 had provided for the inclusion of a very limited number of non-official Indian members in the Governor-General's Council, but they could not introduce any bill without the prior sanction of the Governor-General, who also had, over and above this, the all-important power of veto. The income tax under strong nationwide protests was withdrawn in 1865 to be surreptitiously reimposed again in 1867 in the guise of a certificate tax of 1% on all trades and professions. The next year, it was converted again into a full-fledged income tax, and the rates went on increasing to reach 3 versus percent in 1870. The same year another colonial policy incensed the educated Indians, particularly in Bengal. As the Anglo-Indian press started a propaganda that higher education only bred discontent and disaffection, the government in a resolution on 31 March 1870 proposed to cut back funding for English education in Bengal, allegedly to rechannel funding to promote mass education through vernaculars. The educated Indians were dismayed to find that increased taxation and fund cuts for higher education came at a time when the government continued to spend excessively on army, the home charges and other public works serving the imperial needs. The municipal reforms of the 1870 introducing limited principles of election were a concession to the educated Indians. But this was soon counterbalanced when in 1876 the maximum age for sitting the Indian civil service examination was lowered from 21 to 19 to the disadvantage of the Indians, their older demand for a simultaneous examination in London and India still remained unfulfilled. By far the most vicious attack on the educated Indians came from Lord Lytton who came to India as Viceroy in 1876. He passed in 1878, against the advice of his own law member, the Vernacular Press Act, designed basically to gag the Indian press, which had become critical of the colonial policies. The Act provided for a deposit from all printers and publishers of regional language newspapers, which was to be forfeited and their machinery confiscated if they published anything objectionable. The Act at once became the target of a vehement countrywide agitation of the educated Indians and their various associations, and they found an unexpected patron in Gladstone who raised a few roar in the British Parliament. The same year, i.e. in 1878, Lytton also passed a new Arms Act, which introduced a licensing system throughout India for possessing firearms, but exempted the Europeans and Eurasians from its coverage. In an environment like this, the victory of the Liberal Party in Britain in 1880 brought great joy and expectations among the Indians. Lytton resigned and a Liberal Lord Ripon came to India as the new Viceroy, but the conservative mindset of the colonial bureaucracy did not change. Though Ripon proceeded cautiously, some of his early measures restored faith among the Indians in the Liberal tradition of England. In 1880 to the Vernacular Press Act was repealed and the Arms Act was modified to eliminate the undesirable racial exemptions. In a resolution in May 1882, the Liberal Viceroy proposed to introduce local self-government in India. By the end of 1884, as is, Gopal has shown, the mosaic of local self-government covered almost the whole of British India. This happened despite persistent opposition of the Indian Civil Service and the India Council in London. But all hell was let loose when C. P. Ilbert, the law member in his council, introduced on 2 February 1883 what is known as the infamous Ilbert Bill. It proposed to give Indian district magistrates and session judges the power to try European offenders in the Mofasil, small towns, as they already did in the Presidency towns. 
The ugly face of Anglo-Indian racism now revealed itself in the white mutiny that followed, as the British-born subjects shuddered at the very thought of being tried by a native Indian. The bill was bitterly opposed not just by the non-official Anglo-Indians, but also by a large section of the British officials, including Rivers Thompson, the Lieutenant Governor of Bengal, who reportedly condemned the bill for ignoring race distinctions in order to establish equality by a stroke of pen. The liberal promise of racial equality could not so easily be disavowed, as it was enshrined in Queen Victoria's Proclamation of 1858. The plea for the preservation of racial privileges was therefore coded in a gendered language. The effeminate Babu, it was argued, was not fit to preside over the trial of a manly Englishman, nor could he be expected to honour the dignity of white women, as they did not respect women in their own household. The controversy made it crystal clear to educated Indians that racial equality was something which they could not expect from the present regime. This became more evident when in January 1884 Ripon ultimately succumbed to the pressure and withdrew the bill, substituting it with a milder compromise formula, which somehow sought to preserve the principle by adding a provision of trial by a mixed jury in such cases involving European offenders. The Ilbert Bill controversy was the last straw that politically conscious educated Indians could take as it made them painfully aware of their subordinate position in the imperial power structure. The counter-demonstrations, which they staged, and the press propaganda war that raged on this occasion constitute an important benchmark in the history of the evolution of modern political activities in India. But in the meanwhile, another major change in the organized political life of India had started taking place, the older associations controlled by a landed plutocracy were being gradually replaced by new associations dominated by middle-class professionals. In Calcutta, the British Indian Association controlled by the Zmindari elements came to be looked at as an exclusive body tone by internecine strife. It came increasingly under challenge from the new educated professional classes, which ultimately formed on 26 July 1876 a new organization called the Indian Association, under the leadership of Surendranath Banerjee, with the award ambition of representing the people. In Bombay, the Bombay Association had a new lease of life when in 1876 Norozi Ferdunji and Dada Bhai Norozi returned from London and gave new life to the dying organization. But a two-faced challenge from a younger generation of Western-educated leaders like N.G. Ranade, P.M. Mehta and K.T. Telang and from the establishment of rival associations, such as the short-lived Western Indian Association. Its major challenge, however, came from Pune, the traditional capital of Maratha culture and a centre of old patriotism. It was here that on 2 April 1870 a new organisation, called the Pune Sarvajanik Sabha, was established to represent the wishes of the people and within one year its members collected signed muktianamas or power of attorneys from 17,000 people giving it a true representative character. By contrast, in Madras, political activities remained at a low ebb after the demise of the Madras Native Association in 1862. It was only after 1884, after an interval of more than two decades, that political life in this presidency again started vibrating with the foundation of the Madras Mahajan Sabha. Outside the presidencies too, organized political life revolved round the new associations, like the Lahore Indian Association in Punjab or the Allahabad People's Association in the United Provinces. It should be remembered, however, that the sprouting of new associations did not automatically mean the demise of the older forms of politics. The two idioms of politics, the modern and the traditional, coexisted side by side for a much longer period. The older ways survived in various forms, in Bengal for example, as S. N. Mukherjee, 1971, has shown, it did in the form of days, which were dominated by absentee landlords or dalapatis, leaders of the days. They presided over informal but effective social networks spanning from Calcutta to the countryside, acting as an apparatus of social control. 
The days took position in support of or in opposition to various public issues, any strict line between the conservatives and progressives or between the modern and the traditional became difficult to draw. The same Raza Radha Kanta Deb and his Dharma Sabha, who were so vehemently opposed to the abolition of Sati, supported with enthusiasm the spread of female education. This dull system continued with varied degrees of effectiveness till about the end of the 19th century. Then, as John Maguire has noted, capitalist development gradually weakened its social bonds and its control mechanism. Yet this process of disintegration was long and complex. And Bengal was no exception in witnessing this dichotomy. In the United Provinces two social impulses were channeled through the older caste and communal associations which became platforms for the ventilation of the grievances of a wide variety of people. The older organizations in a new colonial context acquired new importance as they had to confront a more intrusive and supposedly representative government in the towns, therefore, as C.A. Bailey has found, the old connections and the new organizations came to be more closely bunched together. The newness of this politics of the second half of the 19th century, however, lay in the new demands that were being raised. These were sometimes of a local or regional character, but most often they were of national significance. The new associations demanded, among other things, Indian representation in the legislative council, separation of the executive and judicial functions of the government, Indianization of the civil service, and for that purpose simultaneous Indian civil service examination in India and England, imposition of import duties on cotton goods, reduction of expenditure on home charges and costly foreign wars, like the Afghan wars of 1878-1879, rationalization of the financial relations between India and England, and the extension of the permanent settlement to other parts of British India. They also protested against the imposition of income tax, the Draconian Vernacular Press Act and the Racist Arms Act. Apart from raising such public issues, which concerned all Indians across the regions, these associations also took interest in the affairs of the peasantry. Their involvement in the Indigo riots in Bengal, in the Deccan riots in Pune and in the protests against water tax in the Chenab Canal colony in Punjab has already been mentioned. Some of these organizations, like the Pune Sarvajanik Sabha, were involved in a variety of social work among the peasantry, like mobilizing famine relief or organizing arbitration courts. Through such mediation, the Indian peasants, so far locked away in their localized existence, were being gradually connected to a wider national contest with colonial rule. These associations were, of course, not overtly anti-British, as many of them sent messages of loyalty to Queen Victoria on the occasion of the Delhi Dalbar. They were fighting for limited reforms, but nevertheless, they exhibited a new public awareness. They were demanding equality and representative government, above all, a share in the administration of their own country, and this is where the new politics differed from the earlier phase of landlord-dominated politics. But the educated professional leadership of this new politics also suffered from a few dilemmas which originated from the social composition of this class. As observed earlier, they came mostly from the priestly and literary castes who previously held a monopoly control over proprietary right in land. In a way, English education and new professions provided for the extension of the sphere of dominance for essentially the same dominant classes, it was only in Bombay that we witnessed the emergence of a commercial bourgeoisie. So the professionals in most parts of the country retained a connection with land and therefore also fought for landlord interests. This was revealed in the United Indian opposition to the Bengal Tenancy Bill in 1885, which proposed to protect the occupancy rights of the peasants and to restrict the right of the landlord to raise rent arbitrarily. The bill was passed by official majority. These hard-to-conceal dilemmas evoked mixed reactions from the British. The colonial government in the late 19th century recognized the political importance of the new educated class. Particularly, 
Liberal vice royals like Lord Ripon realized that it was essential to provide a fair field for their legitimate aspirations and ambitions and convert them into friends of the Raj. But his more conservative successor Lord Dufferin took a different view and contemptuously called them Babu politicians, representing only a microscopic minority. After the Indian Council's Act of 1892, which introduced in a limited form the principle of election to constitute the legislative councils, the new professional class in terms of political prominence superseded the landed aristocracy, but they could never completely ignore the landed magnates. The colonial state, therefore, could confidently claim itself to be the real champion of the interests of the masses. The limitations and contradictions of early nationalism were visible in other areas too, as many of these high-caste Hindu leaders could not totally overcome their social conservatism. Their attempts to construct a nationalist ideology premised on the notion of a golden Hindu past instantly inspired a wide range of people, but this also alienated some others. The social debates brought in a schism in the Pune Sarvajanik Sabha between the two leaders and their followers, the more conservative B.G. Tilak on the one hand and the liberal reformist G.K. Gokhale on the other. The controversy over the Age of Consent Act, 1891, which proposed to raise the age for the consummation of marriage for women from 10 to 12, centered around the argument that the British had no right to interfere in Hindu social and religious life. Indian nationalism thus came to be associated with the defense of Hindu religion against foreign interference, and the patriotic literature both in Bengali and Marathi started defining Indian nationalism in terms of Hindu imageries. These developments certainly alienated the Muslims from this stream of nationalism, as a new consciousness was developing among them as well. They too were defining their own self-interests in opposition to those of the Hindus and colonial policies further encouraged such Hindu-Muslim schism. As the Arya Samaj started the cow protection movement, this communal conflict began to acquire a mass dimension. Large-scale communal riots rocked northern India from the 1870, constituting certainly a new phenomenon in Indian history. The 18th-century concept of Hindustan being equally shared by the Hindus and Muslims alike was gradually receding in the face of an emerging communal exclusivism in the 19th paving the way for a violent contest for territory in the 20th. This communal estrangement in North Indian society had another important dimension. The Brahmins and the other high-caste Hindus, who dominated new education, professions, and new associations, did not do anything to enlist the support of the lower castes and the untouchables. Yet, despite this apathy and indifference, there were unmistakable signs of enlightenment and social awakening among these lower castes, resulting from colonial educational policies, Christian missionary philanthropy as well as their own initiative. This inspired them to construct alternative political ideologies based on anti-Brahman sentiments, around which powerful movements were organized by the untouchables and the non-Brahman castes in Maharashtra and Madras, aiming primarily at their own advancement. They looked at the emerging nationalist movement as a conspiracy to establish Brahmanic hegemony over the new colonial institutions and viewed colonial government as their patron and liberator. Thus, the political project of imagining an Indian nation from the top had to confront from the very beginning the difficult issue of diversity and difference. The administration obviously took advantage of such contradictions in colonial society and further encouraged them in order to create more impediments for the budding Indian nationalists who, in spite of all their weaknesses and limitations, were raising some unpleasant questions for the Raj. It was in this context that Indian National Congress was born in 1885 and during the subsequent years it dominated Indian nationalist movement trying with mixed successes to resolve these contradictions. If you like this video so please do like, share this video and hit the subscribe button.